Yeah, HIPAA does say all of that. <laughs> HIPAA say what? <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax, HIPAA help is on the way. This is McCarran Holt with Georgia Spine and Orthopedics in Roswell, Georgia, and you are listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. Welcome to episode 282 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs and Security First IT, and joining me is Donna Grindle, CardenHQ.com. <laughs> uh, I didn't know on? you paid attention to which episode it was unless I told you which one it was. I know. Even though it's on your notes. Sometimes I shock you. I know. Just keep me on my toes. Yep. Yep. I hear you. So uh, how's things going in the Cardin world? Um, I'm like a hamster on a wheel. I yeah. keep thinking I'm going to get to, you know, slow down, but then, you know, the wheel needs to turn some more so that things keep moving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're kind of coming to a close of 2020. I think people are finally realizing that all the problems aren't going to go away on December 31st. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Everybody's trying to cram it in. Uh, yeah. You know, there's yeah. half half the people are like, let's just get into 2021. The other people are going like, I just wish 2019 would come back. <laughs> <laughs> let's just, you know, do over. It's kind of like when they, you know, the poor folks up in uh, New York with the big Rockefeller Center tree, you know. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the uh, unveiling of the tree. And uh, it, somebody, <laughs> I saw somebody post the video and on brand 2020 or something like that <laughs> because they stood the tree up and like, it, it's a really pitiful tree. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pitiful tree. And now they're all like, quit making fun of the tree. But it's like, it should be that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it should be that way. You just got to go with that. They, they should just put the Charlie Brown tree out there. With oh, the it one. looks like it. <laughs> it. The bottom part of this tree, <laughs> you just got to go find the video and watch them stand that thing up and let go. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I have to you know, do that. you expect this big, beautiful tree and it. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't expose itself like that. It was more like. <laughs> so I went to I went to the North Carolina mountains uh, this past weekend, and I'm I'm noticing a phenomenon that seems to be happening mostly at restaurants. But it seems that any restaurant that has any figurine type thing sitting outside. Yeah, it has a mask on. So all the wooden yeah. Indian Indians had masks. The the yeah. wooden bears had masks. Everything, everything. <laughs> it's yes. like yeah, every little you know statue statuette mm-hmm. had a mask on. <laughs> I saw somebody. Even the elf on the shelf now comes with a mask. And, <laughs> no. But you know, get the point across. Whatever it takes. You know, at least the the wooden bear will be safe. Yeah. Yeah. A lady told me yesterday that um, somebody 20 years younger than her asked her out on a date, and she's like, these masks are great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I'm going to have to remember that. I'm wearing a mask. Yeah, it's funny. We uh, we took a group picture yesterday, and, you know, <laughs> and I was like, y'all got some ugly smiles. <laughs> The, but you go into a, a group setting and everybody's looking at everybody going, okay, do I recognize this person? Because, you, you know, really the only identifiers you have are the eyes, the hair, and the ears. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's so funny. But uh, anyway, uh, we did, as of today, release the next HIPAA boot camp information. Yeah, it's out on the website. It may not be perfect, but you can register. Mm-hmm. at the hippabootcamp.com and you say register and it takes you to the page or you can go to help me with hippa.com slash h b c what's that stand for <laughs> 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 that's for those people uh, who can't spell hippa properly just <laughs> there you go <laughs> <H-B-C>. so <laughs> we're set for february 23rd 24th 25th in a virtual HIPAA boot camp, we're making some changes. We even talked yesterday to the folks that were in the other one about some of the things that we were doing and what, you know, they want 
So all of the, our plans uh, seem to be going in line with what they wanted to do and their thoughts. So we're real excited about where we're going. And, uh, you know, I'm always a fan of getting input. All of the things that we built at Carden, those have all been based on clients saying, I need this. Uh, okay, I'll go build it. And unlike, I think you will need this in the future, hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is the way it felt when I built it in, what, 2012. And everybody's like, no, I don't need it. But you do, Blanche. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is that. Yeah. So at least everybody now is starting to realize no matter what industry you may be in, this cybersecurity stuff has got to be a thing. So yeah. anyway, good news, you know. We're going to move forward, and we're looking at doing maybe one other in the fall, maybe in August again for 2021. So if you want in, definitely February, and, uh, you know, you can be isolated then, so it'd be perfect. And uh, go to thehippabootcamp.com. All right. Or Good deal. For more information, just send us an email because that's what most people do anyway. Hey, <laughs> will you tell me about that? <laughs> And we're fine with that. Yeah. We are. This is All true. All right, then. All right. Well, we're going to jump into our topic of the day in just a minute. We're going to talk about information blocking. You know, you yes. brought that up in the last episode, so I guess you felt compelled to talk about it this episode. <laughs> I said coming soon to an episode near you. <laughs> and you weren't lying. It was <laughs> pretty soon. So we'll get into yeah. that right after a word from our sponsor. Cybercrime is a multi-billion dollar industry and growing. How confident are you that your computer network can withstand a cyber attack? Can you afford to take the chance that what you have today will protect you? Call us and find out if the cybersecurity in your business is something you should be concerned about or if you can rest easy knowing your business is protected. Visit us online at securityfirstit.com. That's securityfirstit.com. And schedule a time to talk. Did you know that 83% of healthcare organizations report a strong negative impact to their bottom line after a data breach? So many doctors think that they're HIPAA compliant and have nothing to worry about. Many of those organizations thought the same thing before it happened to them. Call Cardin today at 678-292-5001 so they can assess your practice and help ensure you are protected and prepared. Visit CardinHQ.com to learn more. All right, we are back. So <laughs> before we get into the information blocking, we don't want to block the information for our segment of the week, the HIPAA. Say what? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... It, it OCR is on a roll, you know. I know they this are on a the roll. Eighteenth you know, case, eighteenth enforcement action in twenty twenty. We have, um, you know, twelve days of Christmas, and now there's <laughs> the twelve enforcements <laughs> of Christmas. I must, there'll probably be more though. I do expect there to be more than twelve. I know, but, uh, you uh, know, they, they say their point. They're trying to get people to you know take it seriously. Yeah. So tell us about number 12, because uh, there's there's a little bit of some new information. Well, there's just some comments that were made in the the cap that I, you know, got my attention anyway. So I wanted to make sure that we all recognize that HIPAA does say these things. I think that we've mentioned uh, about 150 times that you need to get your ducks in a row with patient right of access. If you are a patient, then you need to understand what your rights are. And if you are a provider or a vendor that deals with patient medical record access, you need to get your ducks in a row because they're all done with this. So this one is the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. The University of Cincinnati <laughs> Medical Center. So... <laughs> You know, it's it's a teaching hospital, right? So you would think that they would have, everybody always says, well, you know, they have all these resources. They have all their stuff together. Not so much. No. <laughs> so this one again from last year, May 2019, they got a complaint 
I always alleging, because remember, these settlements, you don't admit guilt. Right. Right. You just settle so that they're not going to do the civil money penalty. So alleging that the medical center failed to respond to a patient's request from February 2019. And uh, they requested uh, that they send an electronic copy of her medical records maintained in the EHR to the lawyers. I think there was a malpractice thing going on. (laughs) <laughs> and these are just not good practices at all. OCR initiated an investigation, said, yeah, you didn't do that. And uh, we need you to follow that the patient has a right to get an electronic copy and have it transmitted to a third party. They have the right to do that. <laughs> Finally, in August 2019, the patient got their records. So... Roger's quote, which, because I didn't copy it into the notes, you are limited in your ability to do the uh, reading as you normally would. I know. So if I put the notes up for you, that's that's always the best way for me is <laughs> to make sure that you can do things on your own. So we're going we're gonna to make it where David can read. All by himself, the (laughs) 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 all right. So, uh, here you go, David. Can you read that? Oh, wow. Let me move some windows out of the way. (laughs) 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 All right. So, uh, this is uh, Roger Severino's quote. He says, OCR is committed to enforcing patients' rights to access their medical records, including the right to direct electronic copies to a third party of their choice. HIPAA-covered entities should review their policies and training programs to ensure they know and can fulfill all their HIPAA obligations whenever a patient seeks access to his or her records. And, you know, the last time it was like, we're going to keep doing this until they get the point. So I'm not quite sure what happened between them getting the records in August 2019 and this settlement being announced, but clearly it was a uh, a moment. You know, it's been a minute between mm. the times, mm-hmm. <laughs> as they say. So uh, obviously, there's a monetary settlement, sixty five thousand dollars, which is you know pretty high for one of these. They're not hitting you hard on the money. They want you on the two year corrective action plan, right? And that's what we always say. They want you on these corrective action plans. And I find it interesting that, you know, they're coming out and saying it's this big bunch of money or you can go for this smaller amount of money in a two-year corrective action plan where we're going to oversee your program. Mm -hmm. And let me just say that I'm pretty sure the lawyers try first (laughs) to not go into the corrective action plan because we talked about how big of a deal these are. So Mm -hmm. two years of oversight and you've got to uh, supply all these details and you've got timeframes and it does change the way you look at your program. You know what I'm saying? I do. And so their two-year corrective action plan, obviously most of these have focused on making sure that you have the patient right of access details in place and that you're, doing the proper written policies and procedures. Hello. Not just, we will give patients their medical records. (laughs) How will you do that? (laughs) (laughs) And who's responsible for making sure and all those kind of things. So these are the things that they'll focus on in the first 30 days is making sure that they have revamped these policies and procedures. They send them in, they get approval or they update them accordingly. And then they have a commitment that they have to distribute it to all of their staff, which, you know, these policies and procedures they've changed. But then you have a little item here that says that they will, assess and update and revise as necessary policies and procedures at least annually or as needed. And that as you revise them, you'll send them in to OCR for review. So not only do you need to do it, but you're going to need to show us that you've done it. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And you're going to need to make sure that you distribute those policy changes to all of your staff and relevant business associates. And I found this little note, and relevant business associates, and shall require new compliance certifications. What I think they're talking about is attestations uh, more so than certifications, because we all know there's not really a certification. What they're looking for is that confirmation that you uh, have received it and you understand it, I believe is what they're saying there. But the word uh, compliance certification, that that kind of threw me for a loop to see that in one of these. And I think it was just a... <laughs> you you have everybody going, see, there is a certification. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it is. I don't know how to get it. But they mention it. Yeah. Right. And they mention it with business associates. But, you know, it's it's at the end of that long list of all workforce members and all of that. So I just found that odd. I'm going to send in a question. Maybe. I don't know. In the minimum content of policies and procedures, though, I did note a couple of things that you don't normally see. And one, and this is one of those things that HIPAA talks about, and then people are like, what? It is an accurate definition of a designated record set as defined in the privacy rule. Mm, Okay. They have to make sure they have one. And if you go ask somebody, do you have a defined, you know, what is your definition of a designated record set? They're like, the records? (laughs) (laughs) No, you know, because everybody keeps different records on file. So you have to define in your environment, you know, what constitutes your designated record set so that they're all accounted for and dealt with. And when a patient asks for their records, your designated record set is what's included. Makes sense. Okay. Most people, if they have the policy, it's from a template that says, you know, we'll define a def- designated record set. And then somewhere it just says, you know, boilerplate kind of language. So it's a process we go through when we're doing our policy and procedure solution because it's like, what you mean you 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 don't you don't have a designated record set? They're making it clear here. You should have an accurate definition of a designated record set because that directly relates to making sure that the patient gets access to all of their medical records in the designated record set. Mm -hmm. Because you're supposed to give it to all of them. And then you have standard procedures for responding to requests for access, which, okay, that's what we keep telling you you need to have. It's not... This person told that person told that person told that person. (laughs) Everybody follows the same list and checklist and make sure it's followed every time. And, you know, we talk about checklists a lot. But for some reason, people, when I say checklist, they think of it as a to-do list. Yeah. You know, and it's not. The to-do list item is to give this patient their records. (laughs) <laughs> the checklist is to make sure I did that to-do item properly. And I, I, you know, I had a f- conversation with a friend of mine about why don't you use a checklist? Well, I have all that. But then when I like, okay, my to-do item is to post the podcast. But I have a checklist because I do pieces and parts and I get distracted. Pfft, a fly could go by. And I have a checklist to make sure I've done all the things. I realized this week I need to update the checklist (laughs) because I forgot something and it's not on the checklist. But I'm constantly updating my policies and procedures. Thank you very much. Yeah. And that's one of those things that they're saying, standardize it and make sure everybody's doing the same thing. And then, of course, the training and the training needs to cover the business associates involved in receiving and fulfilling the request. And I think that's a big gap, huge gap for a ton of people between I hire a business associate to handle this for me and the business associate actually is, you know, understands what the rules are because they signed a BAA, not enough, right? Right. And then they have to have protocols for training that are involved in the maintaining of designated record sets And other PHI. So there's a note there, designated record set doesn't necessarily mean all PHI, but I think a lot of people see it that way. Mm -hmm. So 
that kind of loops back around. And then I thought this was kind of interesting. Application of appropriate sanctions against workforce members who fail to comply with policies and procedures. All policies and procedures. <laughs> the sanction policy, we run into a lot. You know, and we, you remember when we talk about that in the boot camp, we talk about the sanction policy and the importance of it. Yeah. And everybody's like, well, everybody knows I shouldn't do it. Okay. But what does your sanction policy say? Well, <laughs> that you could be fired for violating HIPAA. Yeah. That's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> no. And you want to make it both subjective and objective, mm -hmm. right? You, you need to make it where there's certain things that you follow this and then there's some personal decisions that can be made. Right. Because nobody likes to fire anybody. Yeah. We're going to fire everybody that violates HIPAA. <laughs> <laughs> Except the doctor. We're not going to fire him. We're not going to do anything to him. Right. Right. So. It, it, but, you know, again, there's the case where somebody went and said, you couldn't fire me because your rule just said I could be fired for violating HIPAA. It didn't make clear that the thing I did would be the thing that would do it. Right. And so – you know, we have a matrix that we built with the ability to, you know, here's your levels. And at some point, there's no more subjective to it. You got to go. Mm -hmm. I thought this was an interesting thing because it didn't focus on privacy rights or patient access rights, rather. It focused on all policies and procedures. Yeah, that is uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so having a proper... And and I assure you, a proper sanction policy is not you could be fired if you violate these rules. Right. That's not. It's not going to cut it. Yeah, that's too ambiguous. <laughs> ambiguous. I like ambiguous. it. Ambiguous. Yep. Well, lawyers like amb ambiguity, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. And then a process for reviewing business associate performance with regard to access requests and responses and sanctioning business associates who fail to permit the medical center to comply with its policies and procedures. Oh. All right, David, now you need to listen to that one. That's interesting. Yeah, if you don't permit them to meet their obligations under HIPAA, mm -hmm. then you should be sanctioned as a vendor. Well, that brings up a whole nother matrix. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and how do you just, you know, oh, well, you know, David, uh, somebody was allowed to log in with somebody else's username. You are not allowing me to meet my obligation, so I now can get out of my contract. Yeah, what kind of sanctions are you putting on a business associate? You don't have a lot of... Yeah. Options there. Well, mostly I could see it, you know, particularly with these uh, right of access cases mm -hmm. of any, you know, there is a penalty on what your payment will be if there is a problem. Yeah, it, it'd have to and, be and, monetary. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what right, are you going to do? Give me three days off without right? pay? <laughs> <laughs> I still want that. You know, I wish somebody would do that. Anyway, I thought that those were all quite interesting and a little bit different than what we're used to seeing. And with that in mind, I was like, yeah, HIPAA does say all of that. <laughs> HIPAA say what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I found it really, really interesting that, you know, some of the way those things are phrased matters. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to look into the... Uh, compliance certification. I think what they're referring to is confirmation they understand, but it didn't sound that way. Yeah. It, it was gray, and you usually don't see that. <laughs> anyway, so David, be prepared for your sanction policies from your clients. Yeah. We don't stop them from doing anything they should be doing. We're often stopping them from things they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, if anything, I should have a sanction policy against my clients. I know, right? Yeah. Well, when you do what, this, we are going to charge you more money. Well, that's why a lot of uh, business associates now are making sure that in their BAAs, you know, because it always says in the downstream contract, if you're not following HIPAA, then I have rights to terminate our agreements. Right. 
right? You know, regardless of what your SLA may say, I have the right because you're agreeing here, you're going to do this. And if you're not, Mm -hmm. peace out. Yeah. But the thing is that it didn't have language going the other way. Right. And a lot of folks are putting in their language going the other way because you could bring me down Mm -hmm. with you, right? If you're not following it and then there's a problem, I could easily, as a vendor, get thrown under the bus, even though I'm trying to get you to do this. Yeah. I mean, fortunately for us, we don't, you know, clients don't come to us and and say, we need you to release records to somebody or do something. So we don't get caught in in that. So I'm not sure. There's plenty of vendors, though, that. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that that would apply to us in any form. I could see. Well, it would if you, I mean, you don't bring in clients that aren't willing to do the security work. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why they hire a security company. Mm-hmm. But if you're, you know, the average IT provider and you have people that are refusing to follow HIPAA and, you know, you know they're refusing, if you truly understand it, <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean you get to go out on a forum and learn about HIPAA and now go out and tell your clients how it works. No. Now, I learned at the University of Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> If you've regularly listened to this podcast or been to the boot camp, any of those things, you know, spend the time getting actual training on what it says. You know, there are some times where you may want to be able to trigger that in mm-hmm. the agreement. Yeah. All right. So we got to go quick here on the last little bit on information blocking. Okay. And it's not that I want to dig a deep, deep dive into it. But I want to make sure that we start talking about it. Do you have some shoulder pads you can wear? Yeah. Helmet? Yeah. Yeah. Some, I'm going to be doing some do blocking. Some information blocking. <laughs> <laughs> information, uh, no. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I can think of a lot of times in my life whenever I've had to do information blocking. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Especially going through a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and mm. when it comes to patient information, we can't do that anymore. Nope. And uh, that was part of uh, it's part of what happened in last week's episode. We talked about information blocking coming from some yeah. people. Uh, it's crazy. And so that was mentioned in this lawsuit that's being filed requesting a class action in Florida with uh, Bay Health and Psyox, I think. Mm-hmm. But they mention information blocking because that's becoming a thing. And <laughs> I love it that somebody sent a thing uh, to uh, me saying, we want somebody to talk about information blocking. And we figure if anybody knows about it, it's you. <laughs> 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 yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but here's the thing. It's not HIPAA. It's right. very HIPAA adjacent. <sighs> wow. <laughs> yes. They're touching. They, they touch, but they don't cross-pollinate. But they do, but they don't. Yeah. So here's the thing. The 21st Century Cures Act that was signed in December 2016. So this stuff's been going on. And it's been slowly building. But the big thing that it was about is promoting innovation, interoperability, those kind of things. And the way that you do that is to make sure all these disparate systems everywhere can talk to each other. You know, there's still a lot of sneaker net going on Mm -hmm. where that machine over there, I take the data off of it on some sort of, uh, you know, USB stick and I bring it over here and I put it in or, you know, the patient gets their data and then they take it with them. There's not a lot of full interaction between most of these systems. And a lot of that has to do with the vendors. You know, the vendors have, it's to their advantage to keep you from talking to other systems. Because if I can send information to other systems, then I could technically send everything you have to another system if you wanted to switch. Mm -hmm. And I could also charge you a bunch of money for doing interfaces. And that's the big flaw in interoperability. Plus, folks did a lot of things that were proprietary. So there's there's a long list of uh, healthcare IT issues, and this is designed to kind of put a kibosh on that. And it's got two pieces, which is the certification, and there's probably a little bit more, but what we're going to worry about is the certification of healthcare IT now has to include 
controls on information blocking and a standardized API using HL7 Fire, which Fire has been the solution to things, you know, for a lot of people that are big proponents of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they really think a lot of it and, you know, see it as solving a lot of problems. For me, I'm a data interface person. That's what I've always done. I love it. I'm excited about this because I see it opening up so many channels because, you know, we'll have a standard. Even when we had the, uh, what it was, National NSF, National Standard Framework for Claims, it was not standard. The only thing that was standard was the names of the records and the things you could put on them. But how you filled them out was different for every payer. Mm -hmm. So there was no standard, really. You still had a different set of code in in there somewhere to deal with each payer's requirement. For example, a referring physician could be put in in the file like six places, maybe. Okay, well, this payer to pay this kind of claim wants it in one and four. To pay another kind, don't put it in four, put it in six. If you put it in four and six and one, it's getting – I mean, it was crazy. So they're trying to reduce that, reduce that, reduce that. Anyways, with all that in mind, that's the big part of an API, an advanced program interface that basically says, I'm going to have a language that I will carry on conversations with other systems, which means all the security people are going to have to secure all of those open API connections. Mm -hmm. The good news about Fire is the traffic itself is encrypted, which is not included in other HL7. So there's a lot of things that are a big deal about it. It's great. I think it's going to be a very big help to innovation and to reduce workload. A lot of administrative stuff could be solved if they implement these things properly. Right. Great. I think it's awesome. But then again, there's the implement it properly thing. (laughs) Always a challenge. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. And so information blocking is another piece of that that says, I can't make it hard to get information, let's just say. So anything that I, as a a provider uh, or a vendor of any sort, whether it's an HIE or health network or whatever, if I'm doing something from, let's say, I implement a non-standard kind of technology. And then I say, well, I can't connect to that because I'm using, you know, something written by Joe Blow. Mm -hmm. Then that's information blocking. I am purposely not using an industry standard connection, which limits my my ability to then share information. Or I am making a decision not to give information to people or I'm making a decision to limit my designated record set, or I'm making it, you know, those kinds of things are information blocking. And if I'm charging more than what would be a reasonable amount, a reasonable profit to do these uh, kind of connections, then that is considered information blocking because I'm making it not cost effective. So there's a long list that gets evaluated on what information blocking is. Technically, it also applies to providers. But there's one big trick here. There are penalties if you're involved in information blocking up to, you know, the same thing they do with HIPAA, up to a million dollars per violation. Right. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and then you never see it, you know, charged that way. But yes, they they do do the, they do do legal maneuvers. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> to, you know, deal with those numbers. And in that set of, uh, you know, here's how we're going to enforce it. Because we all learned with HIPAA, you know, the first HIPAA 1.0, nobody enforced it. So, yeah, which is why we have, it. <laughs> it's why we have HIPAA schmippa now. <laughs> I know, right? Nobody enforced it, you know. So, and that's why it got the way it is. And HIPAA 2.0, people started to get the idea that it was going to be enforced. We're on HIPAA 3.0 now. Mm-hmm. It is being enforced down to very specific issues. But here's the thing is that this is, again, this is not, this is the HIPAA adjacent thing, meaning the patient right of access, which we've been talking about, 
I can't block patients' ability to share that information, get access to that information, have electronic copies of that information. Okay, but primarily, you know, a lot of the vendors are like angry at the providers because they're not doing this. The providers really have no control on how their systems can work. Right. The vast majority of them, either they can't afford these super expensive connections for doing this one thing that won't say, you know, they won't get any kind of ROI on it for 10 years. It's just not making sense for them to do that. So the vendors having to participate in this program to have a certified healthcare IT product anymore is huge. So we've got the serious need, but here's the kicker is that if there is a violation, it is, uh, or a complaint filed for anybody that uh, supposedly is doing information blocking, the complaint is investigated by HHS OIG, the Office of Inspector General, not OCR. Two different offices. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're adjacent. (laughs) (laughs) Right across the hall. (laughs) (laughs) Well, nobody is anymore, right? Yeah. So the way it works, though, is OIG has the legal authority to enforce information blocking rules and API rules on the vendors and the HIEs, and all, but they don't have it on providers. If they have an issue and they feel that there is a provider violating information blocking rules, they refer that to HHS, to the secretary, who is going to determine appropriate disincentives. <laughs> okay. Haven't really seen a good definition of a disincentive. So really and truly, you know, if a, a provider is doing what they're supposed to be doing under patient right of access, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, then as far as you're concerned, that information blocking rule shouldn't be a big concern. What should be a big concern is to make sure your vendors are taking action right now. Not we're gonna, but they're doing it now. Because technically it was supposed to come, it was supposed to, uh, in the law, written that it became effective November 2nd, 2020. Oh. And as, you know, on brand for 2020, that got moved out. <laughs> yep. So April 5th, 2021, This is when it's all supposed to come into play, but there's a, you know, an an extended all the way out through 2023 implementation of all this stuff. So there's the important things for you to know. Any questions, David? No questions. I do think we're going to hear even more about it as we move into 21, all the way through 23, Mm -hmm. because, you know, most people are going to wait until January of 2023. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And just know there's like eight different exceptions to the information blocking rule. This gets you, there's a deep dive that there's tons of things that are considered exceptions because why not? Yeah. You know, there's exceptions. There's just always know. exceptions. Yeah. So interesting, interesting that it's so prolific <laughs> that they must address it with the adjacent <laughs> hippiness. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else to add to that, right? No, that's that's done. That's, we're done. <laughs> All right, folks. That is our show for today. Thanks for listening. Make sure you, that you like this episode and share it out to your uh, well people that you know. You don't have to be friends, you know. <laughs> share it out <laughs> on your favorite social media site. Remember to like, share. Review us. We are now on YouTube Live. We've always had the podcast there on YouTube, but now we're actually on video. On we're not YouTube. on YouTube Live. We are live on YouTube. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> we are live in the recorded version. <laughs> 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 so uh, anyway, go check it out. Leave a comment below the video. That'd be cool. Give Donna something else to do. <laughs> and remember for Donna and myself, HIPAA is not about compliance. Or information blocking. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me with HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. 
for more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.